Greetings and welcome to this evening's Ken and Jean Hansen Lecture, sponsored by the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College. Tonight's lecture features Dr. Kristen Page, Professor of Biology at Wheaton, giving the last of three presentations on the topic, Creation's Call, Stewardship Lessons from Middle Earth and Narnia. Tonight's respondent will be Dr. Emily H. McGowan, Assistant Professor of Theology, who will be introduced more fully later in the program by my, co my Wade co-director, Dr. Crystal Downing. You may submit questions to Drs. Page and McGowan at any time in the Q&A box. Please not the chat box, that has a different function. Our Wade Associate Director, Marjorie Lamp Mead, will be moderating the question and answer portion of the event. The Ken and Jean Hansen Lectureship is an annual Wheaton College faculty lecture series named in honor of former Wheaton trustee, Ken Hansen and his wife, Jean, and endowed in their memory by Walter and Darlene Hansen. Dr. Page is the Ruth Kraft Strohshine Distinguished Chair and Professor of Biology. She holds a Master of Science degree in Zoology and Wildlife from Auburn University and a PhD in Forestry and Natural Resources from Purdue University, where she recently was given the Purdue Distinguished Agricultural Alumni Award for 2020. She often serves as a consultant with wildlife officials on development and use of wildlife disease mitigation strategies. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Ask the Animals to Teach You, How to Regain Wonder and Rejoin the Chorus. Dr. Page, we're looking forward to the bountiful insights and beautiful images you have to share for us this evening. Thank you, David. I'm so glad to be here with you tonight. And I wanna thank the Wade Center and the Hansons for this opportunity to learn about creation care from the Wade authors. This has been an amazing experience. I'm once again using my photography to illustrate my talk and I hope that it, the images will evoke wonder. So let's ask the animals. We share the earth with between 8 million and 1 trillion other species, most of which have not even been discovered and described because they're small, cryptic, or they live in habitats that are difficult to access. When I think about all of the amazing creatures that we're sharing the planet with, I'm overwhelmed with curiosity. I'm driven to want to know more. Where do they live? What do they look like? How do they interact with other species? I've always been this way. It's how I was created. And learning about the diversity of life on the planet brings me great joy. I think that it also brings God joy because we read in Job, but ask the animals and they will teach you or the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? I understand this to mean that the diversity of life that God created is important and worth knowing. Indeed, our first God-given responsibilities were to care for the garden and to name the animals. Tasks which imply that we should learn about creation as naming implies knowing, and to care properly for a garden requires knowledge of what is needed by the life within. This passage in Job also suggests that we can learn something about God as we develop knowledge of his creation. Here's how Dorothy Sayers described the divine knowledge that comes from observing nature and how this practice helps us learn more about creation by understanding the creator. She says, why should God, if there is a God, create anything at any time of any kind at all? The church asserts that there is a mind which has made the universe, that he made it because he is the sort of mind that takes pleasure in creation. And that if we want to know more about the mind of the creator, we must look at Christ. In order to respond to the call to care for and know creation, we must also address the issue that the created diversity of our natural world is declining. Indeed, we're currently living through the sixth mass extinction of organisms in the history of the earth. Thanks to the fossil record, we know that extinctions can occur even without human influence and that the background extinction, extinction rate is estimated to be approximately two extinctions per 10,000 species for 100 years. However, since the 1800s, extinction rates have increased dramatically and have been recorded as high as eight to 100 times the background levels of extinction. Using the fossil record, as well as more recent evidence compiled by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, 
617 vertebrate species have been documented as extinct. And according to the IUCN, there are over 35,000 species in danger of extinction right now. In my lifetime, we've seen the extinction of the Caspian tiger, the Guam flying fox, the Siamese flat barbelled catfish, the Yunnan lake newt, the golden toad, the rotund rock snail, the Pyrenean ibex, the pinta giant tortoise, and the West African black rhinoceros. These are only some of the vertebrates and quite a short list. In fact, in only the previous decade, the IUCN declared 160 species of plants and animals extinct. When I think about how quickly we're losing species, I feel frantic. I feel a deep despair that I've not known more about what God has created before his creatures were gone. I realize that this seems dramatic and that most people do not react this way, but most people have not seen the amazing things that I've seen in my life. And most people do not realize that we're losing species as a result of our own pursuit for comfortable lives. Consider what we read in Genesis as paraphrased from the message. God spoke, swarm ocean with fish and all sea life. Birds fly through the sky over earth. God created the huge whales and all the swarm of life in the waters and every kind and species of flying birds. God saw that it was good. God spoke, earth, generate life, every sort and kind, cattle and reptiles and wild animals, all kinds. And there it was, wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug. God saw that it was good. Reading this biblical story of God's creative and imaginative design for the diversity of the animal kingdom, how can we not mourn the loss of all that he so intentionally created? Each time a species is lost, we lose an aspect of the creator's intentional design, a gift that he's given us for a specific purpose. We should never forget the divine declaration made by the creator as he observed the myriad animals he had just created, and God saw that it was good. I've always been captivated by animals. As a young child, I spent hours playing with my collection of plastic animals, creating and enacting stories that must have been something similar to how I now envision the reconciled earth. Lions and lambs, zebras, bears, eagles, giraffes, all playing together joyfully in the imagined landscapes of my bedroom. I also spent hours playing outside, whether catching crayfish and tadpoles in the creek or walking through the woods behind our house. I can remember sitting under the large branches of an old magnolia. This felt like my own world, a place that fostered my curiosity and creativity. My curious nature was fostered by my family, especially my grandmother, Nanny, who spent time with me in her garden, teaching me about the plants and the birds. My mother also taught me to pay attention to the beautiful details around me, especially while watching birds or when we took long walks at the beach where we picked up beautiful shells and amazing fossils that sparked my imagination about creatures of the past. When I began my undergraduate studies in biology, my very first course was zoology with a professor who would become one of my most important mentors, Dr. Bill Tesca. I love this course. I love Dr. Tesca's excitement when he showed us something amazing about animals. And I love the delight he took in our learning so I took every course I could with this passionately curious man. The summer after my freshman year, I spent a month traveling in a van with Dr. Tesca and 12 other students, camping our way across the United States. We hiked the Grand Canyon from rim to rim. We used black lights to catch scorpions and spotlights to catch kangaroo rats. We birded from Zion to the Olympic Peninsula, and then we saw bears in Glacier National Park. We set small mammal traps every night so that we could see the diversity of rodents and insectivores across North America. We always released everything unharmed and I was absolutely in love with learning. To hold an animal in your hands, to learn something amazing about the way they use their habitat and interact with other species just does something to me. It makes me wonder. It makes the passage in Job seem possible. But ask the animals. Yes, ask the animals. In my senior year of college, I studied ecology in Costa Rica and Ecuador. I saw and learned so many amazing things during this time. 
but perhaps the most amazing thing that happened was on a small boat that we lived on for two weeks in the Galapagos Islands. The captain told us that there were whales in the area and I went up to the deck just in time to see a humpback whale swimming straight at the side of our boat. At what seemed to be the very last second before impact, the whale turned on its side and looked up at me. Looking into the eye of that whale was one of the most wondrous moments of my life. I felt so many things in that moment. I certainly experienced awe and joy. I was curious and I had questions. In that moment, the combination of all those feelings made me feel compelled to act, to learn, to change and to protect. This experience only lasted a minute, if that, but it had a profound effect on me. Have you ever experienced anything like this? My encounter with a whale was wondrous, but I've had other experiences that have stirred similar feelings. And for me, they often happen while camping or hiking or wandering beyond a trail. Not everyone is compelled as I am to experience creation in such a way nor is everyone physically able to hike through natural landscapes due to reasons of health or opportunity. Nevertheless, I do believe that everyone can pursue wonder through making the effort to spend time in fictional landscapes. I remember the first time I heard Aslan's song in The Magician's Nephew. We read, in the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. The voice was suddenly joined by other voices. The blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. The lion was pacing to and fro about that empty land and singing his new song. And as he walked and sang, the valley grew green with grass. It spread out from the lion like a pool. It ran up the sides of the little hills like a wave. In a few minutes, it was creeping up the lower slopes of the distant mountains, making that young world every moment softer. That song, transported me back to beautiful landscapes that I've experienced in my life. And it helped me revisit these places where I've experienced deep joy and places that have left me with many, many more questions than answers. Lainey Shiota is a social psychologist who studies emotion. And she describes wonder as that moment when our minds are trying to stretch, to take in and comprehend whatever it is that's before us. C.S. Lewis invites us to wonder through Aslan's song, and we're encouraged to comprehend the beauty of what we're seeing and hearing. Stephen Buma Prediger, in his book, Earthkeeping and Character, Exploring a Christian Ecological Virtue Ethic, suggests that wonder is a virtue in which we stand in rapt attention and amazement in the presence of something awe-inspiring, mysterious, or novel. As the story of the creation of Narnia unfolds, we're amazed to see everything from moles, frogs, elephants, and even lampposts emerge. As we contemplate the cacophony of these beginnings, something stirs in us. Wonder is more than just a feeling of reverence. It's an action. It's the moment we start engaging our curiosity by asking new questions. So wonder moves us to action just as it did those in Narnia, we read. The lion was singing still, but now the song had once more changed. It was more like what we should call a tune, but it was also far wilder. It made you want to run and jump and climb. It made you want to shout. If we understand wonder as virtue, as suggested by Buma Prediger, we exhibit the virtue when we've cultivated capability to stand in grateful amazement at what God has made and is remaking. I believe this gratitude for the wonder and beauty of nature should then lead us to the desire to act through stewardship of creation. Philosopher Martin Evans seems to agree that wonder should move us to action and suggests that wonder is a transfiguring encounter that results in an altered, compellingly intensified attention to something that we immediately acknowledge as somehow important. As readers of experience wonder through their experiences in fictional landscapes, could they be changed in a way that will impact their interaction with actual landscapes? I believe so. For me, I am moved to action when I hear Aslan's song. For the moment, I am in Narnia, and I respond to Aslan's request to be. Aslan sings, Narnia, 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 awake, love, 
think, speak, be walking trees, be talking beasts. Spending time in fictional landscapes also reminds us of the many amazing aspects of creation that should cause us to wonder. These reminders are necessary as we're easily distracted by the obligations of our lives. We need to be more like children and approach the world with a wide eye sense of wonder and endless questions. The distractions of adult lives make us forget the joy and excitement of learning something new about creation and being amazed. Rachel Carson, the pioneering conservation ecologist noted, it is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed, even lost before we reach adulthood. This loss of a sense of wonder has important implications for our lives. We're more likely to experience wonder when we're surrounded by nature. Yet most of us spend our, more of our lives indoors than out. And it's estimated that the average person will spend at least 90% of their life indoors. Recently, much attention has been given to the health benefits of spending time in nature. Many studies demonstrate how time spent in nature can improve our health by decreasing stress, heart rate, blood pressure, and cholesterol. Spending time in nature can decrease, decrease our risk for type two diabetes, preterm births, and even death due to cardiovascular disease. Walking on forested paths has been demonstrated to reduce perceptions of stress and spending extended time in forests can reduce physiological markers of stress and increase feelings of comfort and refreshment. Interactions with nature can improve mood for those with depression, shorten time for recovery from surgery and illness, improve self-discipline and even improve cognition. Surprisingly, you do not even need to be physically in nature to receive the health benefits. Much of the research shows that simply seeing photographs of natural scenes has benefits for health. Scientists have also linked improved health with reading fiction. So it is possible that spending time in fictional landscapes, especially ones with detailed descriptions of natural scenes has health benefits. Reading fiction is important and our interactions with fictional narratives should not be viewed as frivolous. Stories have the power to change our beliefs about the real world. Tolkien seems to recognize the health benefits of nature and literature. In On Fairy Stories, he describes himself as a wandering explorer in the land full of wonder, but not of information. He was speaking of wandering in and exploring fairy stories, of course. However, anyone who spends time in the fictional landscapes that Tolkien himself has created has likewise been given the opportunity to explore details along his fictional paths and wonder at the beauty of the view. Tolkien's description of interactions between the fellowship and the land through which they journey reflects the way Tolkien himself moved through landscapes. George Sayer described walking with Tolkien as an exercise in interruptions, as Tolkien would frequently stop or slow down in order to look at the trees, flowers, birds, and insects that were passed because I also walk in this exploratory way, stopping to listen to a bird song, to take a picture, or to look at something small and often colorful along the trail, I was not surprised to learn that Tolkien shares my slow reading of nature. I can tell that he paid attention to the smallest details on his hikes, because when you read of the journeys in The Lord of the Rings, he describes the smallest details along the journey of the fellowship. In other words, the time that Tolkien spent in nature influenced his understanding of recovery and escape in fairy stories. And this resulted in his ability as an author to use this concept to help both characters within the story as well as readers benefit from nature and recover. There are many examples in The Lord of the Rings in which characters often are restored over time by wondering at the beauty of nature surrounding them. In the Fellowship of the Ring, as the Fellowship leaves Moria, grieving the loss of Gandalf, injured and hungry, they make several restorative stops. First we read, they stooped over the dark water. At first they could see nothing. Then slowly they saw the forms of the encircling mountains mirrored in a profound blue, and the peaks were like plumes of white flame above them. Beyond there was a space of sky, there like jewels sunk in the deep shone glinting stars. 
though sunlight was in the sky above. What did you see, said Pippin to Sam, but Sam was too deep in thought to answer. And another stop. Soon afterwards, they came upon another stream that ran down from the west and joined its bubbling water with a hurrying silver load. Together, they plunged over a fall of green-hued stone and foam down into a dell. About it stood fir trees, short and bent, and its sides were steep and clothed with heart's tongue and shrubs of whortleberry. At the bottom, there was a level space through which the stream flowed, flowed noisily over shining pebbles. Here, they rested. These stops along the journey to La Florian seem to restore the fellowship. And by the time the fellowship first sees La Florian in the distance, we also see the recovery as they experience the return and renewal of health. We read, there lie the woods of La Florian, said Legolas. That is the fairest of all the dwellings of my people. There are no trees like the trees of that land, for in the autumn their leaves fall not, but turn to gold. Not till the spring comes and the new green opens do they fall, and then the boughs are laden with yellow flowers, and the floor of the wood is golden, and golden is the roof, and its pillars are of silver, for the bark of the tree is smooth and gray. Legolas's description of La Florian is a remembrance of wonder. As the fellowship is anxious about their journey, the joint anticipation of this beauty seems to strengthen them and provide a glimpse of needed hope. However, when they reach La Florian, they find out they must begin their journey blindfolded in solidarity with Gimli the dwarf, who's only permitted to enter the elven realm if his eyes are covered. Thus at first, they do not experience the beauty with their eyes. Rather, they experience the beauty and wonder of the place with their other senses. We read, they felt the ground beneath their feet smooth and soft. And after a while, they walked more freely without fear of hurt or fall. Being deprived of sight, Frodo found his hearing and other senses sharpened. He could smell the trees in the trodden grass. He could hear many different notes in the rustling of the leaves overhead. The river murmuring away on his right and the thin clear voices of birds high in the sky. When the blindfolds were finally removed, Frodo wonders at what he sees. Frodo looked up and caught his breath. They were standing in an open space, malarn trees of great height still arrayed in pale gold. At the feet of the trees and all about the green hillsides, the grass was studded with small golden flowers shaped like stars. Here ever bloom the winter flowers and the unfading grass, the yellow Eleanor, the pale Nephrodil. Here we will stay a while. The others cast themselves down upon the fragrant grass, but Frodo stood a while, still lost in wonder. When we're in nature, we're surrounded by interesting stimuli that allows our attention to be released from the need to focus intently on work or specific tasks. In this more relaxed state, we're more likely to experience nature in ways that evoke wonder and awe. And we're encouraged to engage with aspects of creation we may not have had an interest in before. Lani Shiota explains the benefit of awe. She says, more than any other species on earth, humans are profoundly dependent on knowledge. And this knowledge allows us to map our environment, remember the past and predict the outcomes of future actions, all within the scope of the human imagination. The emotion we call awe, our capacity for deep pleasure and in facing incredible and trying to take it all in, may reflect a basic need to understand the world in which we live. Awe is the first step to developing the virtue of ecological wonder, which is so important to enabling our response to the call to be stewards of creation. Experiencing wonder can be transformational, and this can have important implications for Christians. If we believe that what we read in Romans, that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse, then spending more time in creation may open our minds and help us understand more about our creator and transform us so that we develop a virtue of wonder and gratitude. Paying close attention to the created world around us helps us develop an attitude of openness to wonder. Robin Wall Kimmerer, an indigenous botanist and nature writer, 
agrees and explains that attention is a doorway to gratitude, a doorway to wonder, a doorway to reciprocity. I often refer to the practice of deliberate attention to nature as reading landscapes. And in many of my courses, I try to help my students develop this discipline. I typically ask my students to spend time closely observing the details of a place, paying close attention to everything from what they see and hear to what they smell and feel. In practicing this discipline, I hope that they learn that when we slow our lives and take time to engage in a close reading of creation, we're then able to turn our focus and wonder towards the creator. In this way, spending time exercising deep attention to creation can be similar to religious reading of written texts because it facilitates a relationship between ourselves, the reader, and God, the author creator. What we learn from this type of reading, whether of landscapes or of religious works, should yield meaning, suggestions or imperatives for action, matter for aesthetic wonder, and much more. One important element of wonder is that it helps us develop an attitude of openness or receptivity that leads us from a preoccupation with self into a search for meaning beyond oneself. C.S. Lewis describes such a transformation in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. In this story, Lucy and Edmund return to Narnia with their cousin, Eustace Scrub. Eustace is an unpleasant, friendless, and beastly boy who's never believed the tales of Narnia told by his cousins. Finding himself in Narnia on the Dawn Treader, he still fails to see the wonders of Narnia due to his own self-absorption, and he further alienates himself from his cousins and the crew of the Dawn Treader with constant complaining and grumbling. Following a harrowing storm, the ship is in need of repair and anchors off the coast of a mountainous island. Before he can be asked to help with the work, Eustace leaves the group and begins to explore the island on his own. It's at this point he has an encounter that will begin his transformation. If wonder occurs as a result of something surprising or unexpected, and it stretches our mind to consider the world in a new way, then certainly an encounter with a dragon could be considered wonderful. Not only did Eustace see a dragon, he became a dragon. And through this experience, he realized that he had always been a beast within. He realized that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race an appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he had always supposed. The loneliness is a necessary part of the transformation that Eustace makes. And ecologist Rachel Carson would argue that there is loneliness in a sense of wonder too, what she called a sense of lonely distances. As we feel our isolation from what is profoundly apart, loneliness turns to yearning, a kind of love, an overpowering attraction to something beautiful. Perhaps in this way, wonder draws us to God. Through an experience with wonder, Eustace is isolated from his fellow travelers, experiences this lonely distance, and discovers something about himself. Ultimately, his character was rather improved by becoming a dragon. The most important part of his transformation, though, required Aslan's intervention. And for this, Eustace first had to wonder at his ability to understand a lion. He said, I looked up and saw the very last thing I expected a huge lion coming slowly toward me. It came close up to me and looked straight into my eyes and I shut my eyes tight, but that wasn't any good because it told me to follow it. Then Eustace had to allow Aslan to undress him. We read, the very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. Aslan's work uncovered more of the true character of Eustace. He was no longer a dragon. However, his transformation was still a work in progress because we read, it would be nice and fairly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could, not, when he could be very tiresome, but most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. This is how wonder is for us as well. Wonder begins the transformative work. 
as we pay close attention to nature, we're more likely to notice wonderful aspects of God's amazing creation. We will learn more about the creator and begin a transformation towards stewardship in ourselves based on a virtue of ecological wonder. Wonder appears to be an important part of us recognizing our role as stewards and changing our hearts toward the way we interact with creation. How then do we cultivate a sense of wonder? Casper Henderson explains that wonder opens up new possibilities. It can feel like the apprehension of something bigger and better of which we are momentarily a part. It can feel like discovery or at least the first step on a journey toward one. And it can feel like return or recovery, a sense that something is being put right. Tolkien describes this feeling of return or recovery as crucial to transformation and an important goal of his stories. In Tolkien's short story, Leaf by Niggle, we see such a transformation. Niggle is an artist consumed with the desire to paint a wondrous scene that he holds in his imagination. Yet he's often interrupted by his neighbor. And before he's able to complete his painting, he's required to depart his home on a journey, leaving his painting unfinished. As he was unprepared for the journey, he's forced to spend his days working in unskilled labor and in isolation. While he's gone, the painting is used to repair a roof and the beautiful creation seems lost. After a time of isolation and separation from his art, Nigel is released and sent away for gentle treatment in the forest. When he arrives, Nigel recognizes the forest as the realization of the scene he was painting. In this place, he's reunited with his former neighbor and they work together to plant gardens and tend the land until it's transformed into the landscape of Nigel's imagination. Like Nigel, we may hold an idea in our imaginations of what is wonderful about this world in which we live. However, we're living in a world experiencing rapid transformations that are actually diminishing the wonder of God's creation. We're losing biodiversity at an alarming rate. Climate is changing and we find ourselves at a tipping point where ecosystems are failing. We're at a place where we must make a collective decision to change our behaviors and transform our hearts in order to save our natural world from unfolding deterioration. We must rediscover the wonder of creation, work together to bring back a healthy natural world and allow the wonder to move us to rejoin creation's chorus. If you've ever spent any time in nature with a child, then you know how passionately observant and curious they are. They're closer to the ground and so they notice details that adults often trample. Through their observations and questions, they help adults regain a sense of wonder about everyday occurrences like sunsets. I'll never forget when my daughter Wren called me into the room exclaiming, mommy, hurry, the sunset has all of my favorite colors. Children are very good at recognizing the wonderful and wondering about creation. Wonder comes naturally to them. They just need to be given the opportunity to experience nature. My family loves to camp and hike, and we especially love to be places where we can see birds during the day and stars at night. Several summers ago, Wren, my mom, and I spent an incredible evening stargazing in Canyonland National Park in Utah. We found an out of the way pull off and park the car before sunset. While we waited on the sunset, Wren enjoyed running around on the rocks and watching the ravens catch the uplifts from the canyon below. She also had her cello, and as she played, we all delighted in the response of the ravens. Several flew in close and appeared to be listening. Wren was improvising, playing the music that came to her as she experienced creation. As my mom and I watched, we wondered at the musical conversation between a girl, her cello, and the ravens. As if this were not wonderful enough, several hours later, we sat in amazement as the Milky Way appeared and we were lost in the majesty of the heavens. As wonderful as this night in Utah was, you do not have to go far from home to experience wonder. Spending a year close to home thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, my family and I have discovered that the birds in our backyard are just as curious about the cello as the ravens were. We watch in wonder as the birds fly in while Wren plays. Everything from flycatchers and sparrows to red starts and orioles have come to visit but the cardinals, 
come every time. And that just amazes me. We've also discovered new places to walk together and explore. And we especially enjoy sunset hikes. We've discovered thanks to the approach of Comet Neowise in the summer of 2020 and our strong desire to see it, that we don't have to go too far from our suburban home to find skies dark enough to wonder at the night sky. We're also blessed to be part of a church that worships with children through wonder. We encourage creativity and questions and share in wondering as we experience together the stories of the life of Christ. When you wonder while listening in this way, you're asking open-ended questions, questions that have no firm answer. When we, like our children, engage with scripture by wondering, we're fostering a deep curiosity in them as well as in ourselves. This leaves each one of us desiring to know more about God and his creation. In the Anglican tradition, when a child is baptized, the church is asked if those who witness the vows will do all in their power to support these persons in their life of Christ. When we affirm this, we are promising so much more than to be Sunday school teachers. Rather, we're promising to journey with the child in their faith. What does this look like? How do we truly journey with a child in their faith? An important part of this journey is embracing the wondrous approach children take to learning. Ask questions with them about the natural world and then work to protect what they recognize as wonderful in God's creation. I'm sure if we journeyed in our own lives of faith as a child does, we would all have pockets full of rocks and acorns and we would have many, many questions. In Matthew 19, 14, Jesus invites the little children to come to him for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The gift to us is that if we truly journey in faith with children, we also may grow to understand more about wonder and the incredibly beautiful and fascinating created world where we live, work, and play. Often, we experience wonder in situations where we can recognize the scale of creation. When we're at the summit of a mountain looking out at a horizon or standing on the edge of a canyon or even hiking among ancient trees, we might wonder at how small we feel in relation to the expanses of creation. Stephen Buma Prediger explains that experiencing wonder in this way helps us to develop the virtue of ecological humility, which is the settled disposition to act in such a way that we know our place and fit harmoniously into it. He explains that if we're ecologically humble, we acknowledge that we're finite and fallen and thus have an honest and accurate estimation of our abilities and capacities. Norman Wurzba explains that humility is central to human life because it is through a humble attitude that we must fully approximate our true condition as creatures. And that by developing humility, we can experience the heart of an embodied and spiritual life that is true to the world as a place of belonging and responsibility. Thus, the virtues of ecological wonder and humility that are necessary for us to be dedicated stewards of God's creation are also necessary virtues for our own spiritual development. Humility joined with wonder is an essential response to the current ecological crisis. We must humbly recognize that when we use technology to continue extracting resources, we can actually damage ecosystem services beyond their capacity to repair. However, with all our technology and modern mechanization, it can be quite difficult to see ourselves in this more humble position. It's often only when we face extreme storms or drought or other climate catastrophes that we begin to perceive our lack of strength to meaningfully influence or contain the power of nature. Thus, it's critical that we exercise wonder in order to help us move towards the humility required to understand our place in creation. In the Psalms, David wonders at the beauty of creation and seems to even wonder about his place in creation, that despite the scale of creation, God our creator knows him and cares for him. We read in Psalm 8, 3 and 4, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Like David, 
Madeline Le Engel describes how wonder and humility lead to praise when she describes how she feels gazing at the stars. She says, when I look at the galaxies on a clear night, when I look at the incredible brilliance of creation and think that this is what God is like, then instead of feeling intimidated and diminished by it, I am enlarged. I rejoice that I am part of it. Have you ever seen the Milky Way? If you live in the United States, chances are you are not able to see the Milky Way without a telescope from your backyard, as more than two thirds of us live in highly light polluted regions. Living in environments polluted by artificial light has serious implications for both human health and the health of ecosystems. Light pollution has been shown to have serious effects on humans and other species, primarily related to the physiological effects of altered circadian rhythms. Increased exposure to light at night has been linked to an increased risk of breast cancer among humans and other tumors in wild and domestic animals. Light pollution is also responsible for altered foraging patterns of many wildlife species, changes in predator-prey interactions, and changes in some wild species' ability to orient during migrations. Ultimately, all of these things threaten global biodiversity. What does it mean that light pollution is diminishing the beauty of creation? The scope of light pollution means that many of us cannot experience our smallness under the stars and understand the scale of creation. Without a view of the stars, how can we marvel at the idea that the creator of such a vast and wondrous creation is mindful of us? Wonder helps us understand the scale of creation. It helps us understand that we're small within the scale and diminishes the idea that we're powerful. It reorients us to a right relationship with God, the creator, and his creation. Wonder helps us know how vast the creator's love is for us and orients us towards stewardship of creation. J.R.R. Tolkien describes his character Tom Bombadil as important in orienting the reader to a proper understanding of humility and power. Tolkien says that Tom Bombadil represents taking delight in things for themselves without reference to yourself watching, observing, and to, to some extent knowing, and understanding the rights and wrongs of power and control in such a way that the means of power becomes quite valueless. Bombadil's stories extend the Hobbit's journey into times and places that they wouldn't have otherwise experienced. And as they wonder at the places he describes, they begin to understand something more of their place in the story. We read, he then told them many remarkable stories. As they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest apart from themselves. Indeed, to feel themselves as strangers where all other things were at home. The hobbit sat still before him enchanted, and it seemed as if under the spell of his words. Whether the morning and evening of one day or many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. This time spent wondering seems to put things in perspective for the hobbits. It's important to understand that Tom Bombadil is only able to tell these stories, thus creating this wonderful experience, because he has intimate knowledge of the world in which he lives. In fact, Tolkien explains that Tom Bombadil embodies pure, real, natural science, the spirit that desires knowledge of other things, but is entirely unconcerned with doing anything with the knowledge. Dickerson and Evans in Ents, Elves, and Eriador explains that Don Bombadil represents the pursuit and love of selfless knowledge of the created world and its history, independent of any power or advantage that such knowledge might bring the knower. Thus, we can learn from Tom Bombadil that we should pursue knowledge of creation, but not in order to empower us to subdue creation, rather to embolden us to wonder at our place among the marvels of creation. In the year 2021, is it harder to experience wonder? Not only are we living in a world flooded with artificial lights, we're living in a world flooded with artificial sounds. There are fewer and fewer places on earth where we can experience natural quiet. In the United States, 97% of the population is exposed to noise from airplanes or highways. And we have fewer and fewer places to find quiet. 
Can you believe that the human generated sound is double that of background levels in 63% of our protected areas? Noises provide important cues to living organisms, ranging from those that signal danger and those that indicate the location of a critical resource. Because survival can depend on how an organism responds to environmental noise, many physiological and behavioral systems can be impacted in the presence of excess noise. Studies of the impacts of noise on human health demonstrate that chronic exposure to noise can lead to sleep disturbances, high blood pressure, increased heart rate, anxiety and mood disorders. Additionally, chronic exposure to noise results in decreased cognitive performance of children and adults. Many additional studies demonstrate that these same effects occur across animal species and suggest that there is serious implications for ecosystem health and biodiversity due to impacts on behaviors like bird songs, habitat selection, and the reproductive success of many species. We read throughout the scriptures that creation sings. In Isaiah 44, 23, we read of mountains and trees bursting into song. In the Psalms, we read, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. In a world polluted with noise, can we hear creation singing? One of the consequences of living in a noisy human dominated world is our failure to recognize or remember the natural noises and music of creation. For example, when you experience the talking beasts of Narnia, were you like Diggory and Polly enchanted because you didn't expect to hear a lion talking? We read, it was of course the lion's voice. The children had long felt sure that he could speak. Yet it was lovely and terrible shock when he did. Is it lovely and wondrous to consider that animals can and do communicate outside of Narnia? I'm sure that it's not a surprise to you to know that a lion's roar is a means of communication. But I wonder if you've ever taken the time to consider the complexities of animal communication. Perhaps you thought a lion's roar was just a proclamation of impending doom for its prey. Actually, lions roar to maintain social connections, defend territories, and attract mates. Roars are not indiscriminate, as lions refrain from roaring if it puts them at risk. African elephants use infrasonic vocalizations and can recognize individuals from at least a mile away. Giraffes living in the same habitats as lions and elephants also seem to communicate long distances, with vocalizations described as humming. Mountain gorillas also hum. They hum and sing while they eat, seemingly to communicate that they don't want to be disturbed. Of course, humans are interpreting the communications of other species and we might not actually understand what's truly being communicated. However, taking time to listen to the music of other species can bring us back to wonder and motivate us to stewardship. For example, in the 1970s, when it was discovered that humpback whales communicate with long and beautiful songs, this aided in their protection through laws preventing whaling and by encouraging multinational conservation efforts. J.R.R. Tolkien is well known for his love of trees, and we see trees and forests playing important roles throughout his stories. Anyone who spends time in Middle Earth remembers the ways that trees and forests communicate whether it's Old Man Willow engulfing the hobbits, Treebeard speaking of his lost tree friends, or the members of the fellowship listening to the sounds of the forest. We read, they rode in silence for a while, but Legolas was ever glancing from side to side and would often have halted to listen to the sounds of the wood if Gimli had allowed it. These are the strangest trees that I ever saw, he said, and I've seen many an oak grow from acorn to ruinous age. I wish that there were uh, leisure to now to walk among them. They have voices, and in time, I might come to understand their thought. I wonder if Tolkien understood something about trees that many of us miss. Trees do communicate. I realize that many reject the idea that organisms without nervous systems can be intelligent, but there is mounting evidence that plants interact with each other in intelligent ways, even with plants of different species. If intelligence is defined as a behavioral change in response to an adverse situation and a risk to survival, 
than many of the observed behaviors of plants. Behaviors like predation by carnivorous plants and leaf responses and chemical messaging between plants when a herbivore is present. All of these behaviors could be seen as types of intelligence. The ways that plants communicate work best when plant communities are diverse and undisturbed. For example, fungal associations with roots called mycorrhiza are known to increase nutrient absorption from the soil, but they also allow for cooperation between different tree species that share the networks. These fungal networks take years and years to develop and result in a connection between trees, allowing them to communicate via chemicals and share nutrients between plants in light and shaded areas. Trees also communicate with and respond to sound, both environmental sounds like running water and sounds produced by other plants. Scientists have been able to measure the orienting response of plants to running water. And the same scientists have also discovered that plant roots respond to the sounds emitted from other roots, specifically a crackling at 220 hertz. Did you know that 220 hertz is heard by the human ear as an A? I personally find this fascinating because the A at 220 hertz is an octave lower than the pitch that many orchestras use to tune, A440. When I learned of this connection between the frequency emitted by plants in nature and the frequency used by musicians playing instruments made of wood, it made me wonder at the connection. I wonder if we've just stopped listening to the music of creation, and this is why it surprises us when we realize we recognize the tune. If we are lacking evidence that humans can understand the music of creation, there is quite a bit of evidence that other species understand our music. For example, I'm amazed that goldfish can learn the difference between genres of music, and pigeons can distinguish between a major and an augmented chord. Intentionally seeking amazing or beautiful aspects of creation, whether through experience or knowledge, helps us develop the virtue of ecological wonder. Wonderful things happen around us all the time, but we're busy and quickly tune out the chorus of creation. It's easy to tune out the common sights and sounds around us and lose sight of wonder. Have you ever heard the dawn chorus of birds? Do you know how, which of the flowers are going to bloom first in your yard? Have you ever watched a sunrise or a sunset recently? We need to rediscover our childlike curiosity, re-engage all of our senses and rediscover the wonders of creation so that we're motivated towards stewardship. When we're children, there's everything to learn. As adults, we need to reject the idea that we know everything or enough. When we make the effort to wonder at the natural world, this stance helps us return to a childlike receptivity to learning. As George MacDonald cautions, to cease to wonder is to fall plumb down from the childlike to the commonplace, the most undivine of all moods, intellectual. C.S. Lewis seemed to be drawn to Christ by his experiences with joy, often in nature. He understood that creation sings God's praises and draws us back to a place where we can experience God. He said, at best, our faith and reason will tell us that he is adorable, but we shall not have found him so, not have tasted and see. Any patch of sunlight in a wood will show you something about the sun, which you could never get from reading books on astronomy. These pure and spontaneous pleasures are patches of godlight in the woods of our experience. Tolkien's saga of Middle Earth, specifically the fate of Isengard, should be a warning to us when we lose our sense of humility and think we know better than the creator. We read, a strong place and wonderful was Isengard and long it had been beautiful. And there great lords had dwelt, the wardens of Gondor upon the west and wise men that watched the stars. But Saruman had slowly shaped it to his shifting purposes and made it better as he thought being deceived for all those arts and subtle devices for which he forsook his former wisdom and which fondly he imagined were his own came but from Mordor, so that what he made was not. Are we living in a time of shifting purposes? Saruman embraced the wrong wisdom. His lack of humility broke his connection with creation, and Isengard was no longer beautiful. 
If we can cultivate a virtue of wonder and humility, we will understand ourselves as a created part of creation, once again hearing and even joining in the chorus of praise to our creator. When we fail to exercise wonder and delight in the natural world, we open ourselves up to the risk of following Saruman's lead by believing that we've discovered new and better ways to shape creation and use its resources. When we approach creation in this way, our actions inevitably lead to depletion of resources, destruction of ecosystems and natural beauty, volatile weather patterns and the irreversible alteration of our world in ways that harm us all. In contrast, when we take time to read landscapes as well as stories, we embrace an important safeguard that reminds us to wonder at the natural world and helps us to better understand our own role as one who is called to humbly serve the creator in caring for his world. Doing this is not easy. In fact, it requires a radical reorientation of our perspective. As the master of paradox, G.K. Chesterton explains, the natural thing would be that man should live with the natural things, trees and water and animals, and should, as an exceptional treat, go and look at great buildings and impressive works of art. But for us who live in cities, nature is not natural. Nature is supernatural. Just as monks watched and strove to get a glimpse of heaven, so we watch and strive to get a glimpse of earth. Thus, the extraordinary thing that Chesterton and Lewis and Tolkien also would have us remember is that in learning to rightly view our earth by seeing it through the lens of wonder and humility, we will also receive a glimpse of heaven here on earth in the splendor and beauty of our created world. So as we strive to live as stewards of our natural world and not as the ruler, we will be richly blessed by receiving the true gift that creation was intended to be from our loving and wise creator, God. Wonder is a gift and we do not have to work at all to receive it. Yet it can transform us and move us to love. Love for God, the creator, for his creation, and also for our neighbor. Casper Henderson says wonder can feel like enough or like a good point from which to start. It's a state of mind in which we can accept a gift and apprehend its importance, if not necessarily its meaning. It's a kind of grace. Perhaps this grace helps us to be the people of Christ who love our Lord with all of our hearts, souls, and minds, and our neighbors as ourselves. To receive this grace, we need to spend more time in creation, the place where God dwells, looking, listening, and participating in stewardship. We need to wonder at the fact that we're part of this amazing creation and that God has entrusted us with caring for these beautiful places and creatures and even processes. When we look, we can see ourselves as part of the chorus of creation. We can listen to creation's groanings and praises and also learn about our responsibility as stewards. Finally, we can communicate and cooperate with each other and ultimately rejoin the chorus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Page, for igniting wonder and drawing us to a sense of responsibility for our environment. I have the privilege of introducing two people this evening, but before I do so, I have several announcements to make as co-director of the Wade Center. First, we're excited to announce that the next Hansen Lectureship has already been set up and we will be hearing in the internationally known Christian historian, Dr. Mark Knoll, speaking about the reception of C.S. Lewis in America when his books were first published here. He will present his first in a three-part series on Thursday evening, November 4th. So put that on your calendars. And we are hoping very much that that will be a live presentation in the Bakke Auditorium. Before then, you have an opportunity to attend a virtual event on April 22nd 
a Thursday at 7 p.m., where my co-director, Dr. David Danning, will be doing a book talk about his recently re-released novel, Looking for the King, which has the character of Tolkien, Lewis, and Charles Williams um, as part of the narrative and has them at an Inklings meeting. If you are not yet on the Wade uh, email list, you can go to the chat function and you will find a link there where you can sign up so you can learn about other events in uh, the Wade schedule as well as Wade news. And now for the introductions. First, I am delighted to introduce our Associate Director at the Wade Center, Marjorie Mead, and I introduce her because she has been coordinating all of the Hansen lectureships from the very start. She has arranged uh, with the lecturers their schedule, setting up the respondents, and very importantly, working with InterVarsity Press in order to get these lectures published. It is a monumental task and she has done it with gracious um, discernment. So I have invited her to lead the question and answer session this evening in order to draw attention to all that she has done for us. Your, once again, your questions can be entered in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and can be directed to either Dr. Page or to our respondent, who I will now introduce. Dr. Emily McGowan started at Wheaton the exact uh, same time that David and I began and we first met her at faculty orientation in August of 2018, and I liked her immediately. I sensed in her a intellectual acuity combined with spiritual depth. Uh, Wheaton is privileged to have her teaching theology. Her PhD is from the University of Dayton, and her scholarship is especially focused on lived embodied experiences of everyday Christians. And we can see how that is relevant to this evening's lecture where uh, Dr. Page drew our attention to the interdependence of bodies, all kinds of bodies in our environment. Dr. McGowan is also a priest and a canon theologian with Churches for the Sake of Others. Her first book has, was published in 2018. It's called Quivering Families, and she addresses the quiverful movement among evangelicals in America. And she's currently working on a popular practical theology for families. So now, Dr. McGowan. Thank you, Dr. Downing and the Wade Center for the invitation to respond to Dr. Page's third and final lecture this evening. It's a privilege for me to be here. Um, I'm what you would call a big fan of Dr. Page's work, her teaching uh, scholarship at wildlife photography and I'm very fortunate to be able to call her my friend too. I think the best place to begin is with a personal confession. I don't consider myself an outdoorsy person. I have lived in some of the most beautiful landscapes in the United States, including near the Appalachian Mountains in Virginia, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and now the prairies of Illinois. And yet, when I find myself with a rare open day, my first impulse is to curl up on the couch with a book and a blanket. A hike through the woods doesn't typically register in my mind as an option. 
I begin with this admission because I think it's important for me as a respondent to acknowledge that I'm precisely the kind of person who needs to hear and heed Dr. Page's lecture. During my childhood, my life circumstances allowed me plenty of time to explore and play outdoors. I have vivid memories of delving into the woods and creek behind my home in Northern Virginia. I can still remember the various kinds of mushrooms and ferns, tadpoles and frogs, water snakes and garden spiders that we found along the way. I spent countless hours back there exploring and make-believing with my friends. But at some point, probably around junior high, I stopped playing outside. And without the influence of wise guides who could usher me back to creation and back to wonder, I will admit that I didn't notice the loss. Tonight, Dr. Page offers me and others like me reason for hope. Drawing on the work of Stephen Buma Prediger, she suggested that we understand wonder as a virtue. We exhibit the virtue of wonder when we have, quote, the cultivated capability to stand in grateful amazement at what God has made and is remaking. This approach is something of a departure from what we might call classical accounts of wonder, but it remains an intriguing and promising perspective. The great philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas classifies wonder as a species of fear, that is fear of ignorance. One who wonders, he says, is at once excited by the novelty encountered and fearful of what is unknown. Yet, Thomas says, wonder is unique because it is the only form of fear that is pleasurable. In his words, quote, wonder gives pleasure insofar as it includes the desire of learning the cause and insofar as the wonderer learns something new. Thus, the one who wonders is compelled to seek the knowledge of things in their causes. So for Thomas, wonder is a feeling, a special type of fear that is also pleasurable. To see wonder as a virtue though, as Dr. Page suggests, means it is something that can be cultivated and grown and lived into. Rather than an emotion that simply comes upon you unexpectedly and outside of your control, wonder as a virtue can be pursued and practiced. The significance of this distinction might be better understood with reference to other kinds of virtues. So returning to Thomas Aquinas, he follows Aristotle in suggesting there are four cardinal or primary human virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude or courage. These cardinal virtues, he says, are in every human being inchoatively, that is, in an imperfect or undeveloped way. But because virtues are essentially habits, which Thomas calls the perfection of power, he says we're able to grow in them. We can become more temperate or courageous, for example, by participating in practices that cause us to demonstrate temperance or courage. Maybe choosing moderation in the amount of food we eat, for instance, or choosing to take hazardous hiking trips on a regular basis. So through intentionally cultivating virtuous habits, one can begin to exhibit the virtues without thinking about it. Uh, that is to say, living as though temperance and courage are what we would call second nature. Now, whether wonder can be properly understood in the classical sense of virtue uh, is a question I really can't answer definitively in this brief response, but I can say it is a line of thinking that other scholars have suggested too. If it can, then it would be very good news for people like me who find themselves regularly bereft of wonder. And there would be a sturdy theological and ethical basis upon which to pursue the cultivation of wonder through habits and practices. Dr. Page has given us at least two major ways by which to cultivate the virtue of wonder, interaction with our local ecology and interaction with fictional landscapes. Dr. Page has demonstrated beautifully for us throughout this series of lectures, what it looks like to attend carefully to the landscapes of Narnia and Middle Earth. As we ponder further what it might look like to intentionally read our local landscapes, as she says, 
The Christian tradition offers at least one spiritual discipline that we might thoughtfully employ. Visio divina, Latin for divine seeing, is the art of praying with images or other media. One scholar calls it a way to pray with the eyes. Visio divina is typically used with sacred art, icons, frescoes, or paintings, but I've also found it works quite well in our own backyards. After all, Psalm 19 says, creation declares the glory of God, pouring forth speech day after day. What if we prayerfully listened? What would we hear? I can pray with my eyes, along with walkers, runners, and cyclists on the Illinois prairie path. And I can imagine beginning a hike through nearby Mathiasen State Park with the reading of James Wendell Johnson's poem, The Creation. Johnson says, then God himself stepped down and God walked and where he trod his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bulged the mountains up. Then he stopped and looked and saw that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down, the cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted and the little red flowers blossomed. The pine tree pointed his finger to the sky and the oak spread out his arms. The lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground and the rivers ran down to the sea. And God smiled again and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land. And he said, bring forth, bring forth. And quicker than God could drop his hand, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods and split the air with their wings. And God said, that's good. How could we not pray, worship and wonder after reading such a work in the context of God's bountiful creation? In addition to practices of individual devotion, we shouldn't miss the significance of moral exemplars or what we might more colloquially call mentors. It's clear that Dr. Page was mentored in wonder through her nanny and Dr. Tesca, not to mention the adults who accompanied her on the formative trip she took to Costa Rica and Ecuador. Those of us who want to be rehabituated to wonder will need similar mentors and moral exemplars. Perhaps Dr. Page herself should be among that group. I know she is for me. But I would also want to point us toward a population that we might be tempted to overlook, but Dr. Page certainly has not. Children. She's encouraged us, we need to be more like children to approach the world with a wide-eyed sense of wonder and endless questions. And to that I say yes, indeed, and who better to teach us than children themselves? Why would children be exemplars and mentors in wonder? Well, the Christian tradition offers very good reasons for it, I think. In the gospels, children are chief among the least of these and recipients of the kingdom of God. In a time when children were never offered as models for adults in anything, Jesus explicitly points to them as examples to follow. Moral exemplars, if you will, for receiving God's kingdom. Jesus seems to think it's precisely in their dependency, humility, and trust that children demonstrate how to embody God's reign on earth. Given their unique status, then, it doesn't seem inappropriate to suggest children can serve as teachers, mentors, and moral exemplars in the virtue of wonder. In fact, I've argued elsewhere that children may have a particular vocation to wonder, Perhaps it's time to acknowledge being with children as a vital spiritual practice, not just for folks who consider themselves kid people, but for all in the body of Christ. In addition, it's arguable that children have even more to lose than we do if the people of God can't regain wonder and rejoin the chorus of creation. Maybe it's time to let them take the lead. As I bring my remarks to a close, I wanna underline Dr. Page's call to wonder with a reminder of the telos or the ultimate goal 
to which all of this is moving. Growth and the virtue of wonder, practices of wonder, moral exemplars and wonder, what's it all for? We are creatures of dust, dustlings, if you will, made to find ourselves in the midst of creation, God's dwelling place. So wonder and awe are part of what it means to be human. But many of us have lost sight of this in our highly regimented, largely indoor, screen-focused existence, I myself being the chief of sinners. Certainly there's a good reason to care for creation in its own sake. It is a good gift of a good God and we're squandering it. But there's a way in which through the care of creation, we become more fully human too. This is not to romanticize nature. Creation, which is both glorious and fallen, remains a dangerous place. We experience wonder and awe in part because of how little control we have over the threats of the natural world. But the fact remains, we are creatures. We are, in the words of Beth Felker Jones, middle creatures in whom the spiritual and material realms come together. We, with all of creation, find our ultimate end and purpose in Jesus Christ, the God-man, who unites for all time the transcendent holy God and the finite material world. Learning to see ourselves within Christ and in Christ among the created world, a living bridge between heaven and earth is central to our vocation as human beings. Learning to, as Dr. Page says, understand ourselves as a created part of creation is part of reclaiming our humanity in Christ, the one whose voice rings out over all creation. Behold, I'm making all things new. Thank you for this chance to respond. We're now going to turn to the Q&A time. Please go ahead and enter your questions for either Dr. Page or Dr. McGowan or for both of them into the Q&A box. Um, thank you so much, Dr. McGowan, for that just wonderful response, um, the way you enhanced and <laughs> brought out so many important threads from Dr. Page's lecture. I'd like to invite you to begin with the first question tonight. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Page, one area that you and I both really didn't get to delve into, because even with all the great stuff, there still wasn't enough time to cover everything, um, is how to cultivate wonder beyond the level of the individual and the personal. Um, I find that when I think about this, it's hard for me to get beyond the realm of personal piety, as important as I think that is. And that's an area that I need to grow in, as I've admitted. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering about wonder. If you were in charge of the world, <laughs> if you like could imagine social communal changes, what kinds of changes would you like to see to the way we do life together? Either thinking about institutions, thinking about communities, even thinking about a nation. What kinds of things do you think need to change for us to cultivate wonder in the way that you've laid it out here? I know that's a big question, but that's where my mind goes. Okay. <clears throat> well, the first place that I go to when I hear that question is we really need to kind of rethink about power. Mm. Um, I, I feel like our understanding of power and who's in control and who makes the decisions, you know, when the national parks were first created, the biggest problem was that People saw this as, oh, it's public land. That means it's mine. That means I can do whatever I want with it. And they were going in and poaching everything and everything from the thermal, um, in, in Yellowstone, they were taking the thermal features, taking um, steam off of the thermal features and they were killing the predators and poaching all of the, um, the fur bears. And, and so like our power over nature um, really sets us up to kind of lose lose that wonder when we think that we have control over it. I'm also um, thinking about, we just need to come up with better ways to make wonderful things accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has access to a pretty window like I do that looks out over a bird feeder. Not everybody looks out at green. Many of our neighbors just in Chicago look out at brown and dirt 
and they, you know, so we have to come together um, as a society to really prioritize green spaces, to prioritize preservation, to diminish use and um, build up the idea that um, that we're part of creation and, and we shouldn't ex exert power over creation. I think that that's where my mind first goes with that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Page. Um, another question for you from Erica Filer, who first of all, thanks you for your wonderful insights and then says, at the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that not everyone has the opportunity to spend time in preserved parts of creation due to their socioeconomic status and or physical disabilities. It seems like literature could play a special role in the redemption of creation, specifically for these people who don't have access to the physically redeemed parts of nature. Do you have any additional thoughts on this topic? I think um, some of what I said in my, in my first answer um, applies here, certainly. Like if we could just, um, maybe it be could become some of the work of the church to try to restore some green spaces in places where people don't have access. Or um, maybe we can encourage um, teachers that teach in places where people don't have access to green spaces to choose literature that introduces children to natural spaces and to beauty and to wonder, but to teach it in a way that evokes the wonder, not just to teach the text, but to actually um, teach the stories that, that get the students drawn in. And I, I think about um, friends of mine who have disabilities that can't actually go out and walk the places that I walk, I often think of this. And I think that um, there's room for us to, to reconsider, those of us who have means to reconsider um, our desire to support changes like at the forest preserves, like could we have more paved trails where people can access some of nature? Not every trail should be paved, obviously, but there should be more access um, many of the national parks have accessible trails and this type of thing. Now, I never thought that I would say anything about screens in this lecture. <laughs> However, um, there is a role for screens. And um, I, when I teach um, ecology especially, my students love Film Fridays. And on Film Fridays, I try to find things that I've kind of envisioned in literature or different concepts that are just amazing. And I love Sir David Attenborough and, um, and all of his films. And we watch um, at least one film every Friday so that my students who haven't really experienced wonder in nature kind of start out in a safe way and experience it through a screen first. And then they actually do start to get out and um, to explore on their own as well. Thank you. Um... Let's see, um, Linda Richardson has a question for Dr. Page. Can you share any more about your seeing eye to eye with the whale? Yeah, that was, it was such an amazing moment. Well, first of all, most of my classmates just stayed down below. And so I was really up there all by myself. I just ran up, I really wanted to see a whale. And um, I found my photo album, you saw a few of them tonight, and I, I didn't really get a very good photo of it. It just kind of looked like the, the photo of the whale you saw tonight, I confess, is actually not the one that I saw um, in Galapagos. But um, so I was just standing there and I really at first thought that I was terrified. I mean, that is part of wonder, right? <laughs> I was terrified he was gonna slam into the side of the boat and then all of a sudden it just tipped up on its side and. I look, I, it was like I was falling into, I don't know, this place. Like we literally looked eye to eye and I, I felt seen and to feel seen by a wild animal is, I don't know really how to explain it. Everybody should experience it. Um, I just felt seen, I felt known. And um, I felt like the whale was just as curious and wondered just as much about me as I wondered about the whale, so. Thank you. It's really beautiful. Um, Dr. McGowan, Tim Larson writes, 
Can you tell us about your own reading and encounters with some of the Wade authors? If you were to do the Hanson lectures, is there an author or theme that you would like to pursue? Oh goodness, that's a great question. Yeah, so my encounters with the Wade authors. So um, I read the Narnia books as a child. Um, I think only maybe read the first two or three before I became a Christian and then read them as a young adult Christian after my conversion. And they had so much more meaning uh, for me. The story of um, uh, just of Eustace's um, encounter with uh, Aslan has been uh, just really important in my own thoughts about my formation um, as, a, as a Christian. Um, Tolkien I discovered later in life. Um, I always knew of the Lord of the Rings series, but I was intimidated by the size of it. Um, but I have now read through that series um, three times, the third time this past year. In fact, when we went into lockdown uh, almost exactly a year ago, uh, I, I picked up uh, the Fellowship of the Ring again and said, I think I need to journey with a company that is facing down challenges together and uh, is not intimidated <laughs> by the darkness around them. And so um, those stories actually accompanied me through the first few months actually of, of being in quarantine. Now the, the Wade writer that I think I would like to, that I'm most intrigued by that I don't know as much about is Dorothy Sayers. Um, I have used a couple of her pieces in my Christian thought courses. Uh, I really enjoy her essay, Are Women Human? And so mm -hmm. I've used that to talk with my students about gender. And then uh, she's got this delightful little piece. I think it's called the drama is the dog, Dra drama is the doctrine or drama is the dogma. <laughs> dogma is the drama. Thank you. That's the way it is. Dogma is the drama. Um, and I think, I think maybe I would love to engage with her a little more. Um, I love the way she tends to turn things on their head and look at them differently from the way others do. And um, yeah, I would probably want to, to use that opportunity to get to know her a little more. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that. Sayers is a particular favorite of mine for sure. And you'll, you'll be surprised just the riches that are there if you have time to pursue it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for both. Dr. Page and Dr. McGowan from David Downing. Why do you think that conservative Protestants are so often climate change skeptics? Well, I mean, the obvious Im immediate answer is that um, it's tied with politics and um, it's very scary to, um, to maybe tease apart certain topics and so I think that that's kind of maybe the the easy part of the answer perhaps the perhaps um, another part of the answer would be that we understand ourselves as humans in a place of power because we understand our image bearing as giving us more of a, a role to to subdue and use not necessarily in ways that I read Genesis asking us to use, but, um, or any of the scriptures for that matter, but to use in ways that just move us to an end perhaps of a, a burning up of the earth, right? So many people just understand climate change as, as part of the process of us moving towards the new earth. And so they tend to resist the idea that it's a problem. And there's lots of reasons um, why evangelicals um, or anyone for, for that matter might um, resist climate change. Um, but those are the ones that I most frequently run up against. It's, um, it's really tied to strong convictions about, about life, human life, and strong convictions about their understanding of the way that the world will end, perhaps. So. Thank you. I think I might want to add to that just in terms of like historical context of the, of at least evangelical Protestants in the US. Um, we have, it doesn't have to be this way, but unfortunately we're inheritors of a tradition that has often seen itself at odds with science. 
um, from the, the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, many of our leading lights perceived scientific discoveries, particularly the writings of Darwin as a threat. Not everyone did it first, but eventually it did become kind of a larger cultural phenomenon that was seen as an attack on the Bible, an attack on truth. And so I think unfortunately that posture still remains in many circles. I get, especially students the, who are younger coming in, many times come with this assumption that there is a, a conflict between faith and science, that they're necessarily at odds with each other. And um, I don't know, I see that as sort of a latent problem here too. It's not as overt, um, but there is sort of a, a mentality that science must be at odds with faith rather than seeing them as complementary. Um, yeah, that's a historical observation. Yeah, thank you. I think you both touched on in different ways um, the value of humility and maybe helping to overcome some of these issues. Um, have another question here for Dr. Page. Can, can you share with us a time that in your travels worldwide you have seen or heard awe or wonder at nature expressed by rural or people who grew up in a farming or agricultural environment? And in other words, they live there all the time, but they still have a sense of awe or wonder or any familiar place that is a part of someone's everyday livelihood. Yeah, this is actually, it's a question that I often ask. I'm in a beautiful place and I'm just in awe of how beautiful it is. And I'll ask, you know, do you just look at this and think how beautiful it is every day? And of course, many people say, oh yeah, it's just the mountain, I notice it. Um, and, and it's pretty, but one, one story comes to mind. And I was in um, Southern Tanzania I mean, really, it's probably one of the most remote places I've ever been. And I was visiting with families who um, received gifts from Heifer International. So get, Heifer International gives um, livestock to communities. And, um, and so it was, and they also really facilitate a lot of sustainable um, ways to approach agriculture. And we were visiting with this woman who was a leader in the community she, um, she was showing us her beautiful cattle, her um, chickens, her amazing farm. I mean, it was just a beautiful farm. It was the only thing growing around because she had learned to collect the manure from her cattle and turn it into fertilizer. And she even captured the urine and used that in productive ways on her farm. Um, she, the, the coolest part um, was they collected the manure and they had a pit and they, um, they used the methane from the, the cattle manure to light their homes and to cook. And um, I said, so, you know, what is the best part of this to you? And, and she looked at me and she said, my children are gonna see the trees on the mountain. We're not gonna have to cut them all down to cook our dinner. Hmm. I just lost it. I was just blown away. I mean, she definitely, saw that she was able to save the beauty around her for her children um, because she didn't have to cut the trees anymore. So, Thank you. Well, that's a lovely note to end on and a reminder of what both of you have done in leading us into a deeper sense of, of awe and the cultivation of wonder and Certainly we've experienced it through your words tonight, both of you, and through your photographs, Dr. Page. Those who would enjoy the opportunity to experience wonder in that way again, a reminder that all of these lectures have been recorded and are available through the Wade Center's YouTube channel and through our website. So um, thank you all for being a part of this um, really very um, significant conversation. And just for all that you have helped us understand better about the beauty and the gift that creation is. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.